Thanks. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Human AI Partnership, How Artificial Intelligence is Changing Our World event. My name is Janita Jung, and I am the lead of the Young Professionals portfolio of the UQ Young Alumni Advisory Board, and I'll be your MC for this evening. To start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. We have an exciting discussion lined up for you all today. Um, as a fellow AI enthusiast, I'm excited to be here with you all tonight to explore the incredible opportunities and challenges of generative AI. Before we get into the panel discussion, we're thrilled to have Professor Sueli with us tonight to provide an exciting demonstration of the latest advancements in AI research and development. Um, tonight, he'll be showcasing a new piece of technology that illustrates the partnership between human and AI in the medical industry. Specifically, he is developing a platform that is designed to assist ICU departments in hospitals. This platform represents an exciting opportunity for AI and humans to work together to improve patient outcomes. After the demo, we'll move on to our panel discussion, moderated by Tim Anderson, with an impressive panel of experts, including Professor Lee himself, Claire Norton, and Dr. Jessica Court, including, um, including research, legal and ethics, industry implementation, and end user perspectives. We're in for a lively discussion, I think. Um, as you may have noticed on the projector screen over here, um, we'll be using Slido to engage you in conversation through live polls and Q&A tonight. So to join, to join in, simply just scan the QR code um, or go to slido.com and enter the code UQAlumni. Without further ado, um, sit back, relax, and get ready to learn and be inspired by our brilliant minds here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Professor Lee to the stage. I came to Australia many years ago as a student, and I was uh, excited to get an Australian scholarship. And when I come to Australia, it's a completely new country to me. After I got a master's degree in UQ and a PhD degree in QUT, I was one of the first PhD graduates in QUT, and I worked for QUT for eight years. And then I worked for UNSW, for three years, and then I came to UQ <laughs> to work for UQ for 23 years, since 20, 2000. Yes. Today's topic is uh, AI with the human partnership. So what is a partnership? You got uh, for better, for worse. <laughs> you got a partner. <laughs> and uh, do you trust it? Do you really? enjoy your partnership with them. So at least there are three points we need to understand. Firstly, AI is an amplifier of human intelligence. We get the support from them, but who is the boss, right? We must make a clear position. <laughs> and secondly, is AI with a human-centered. So it's a human-centered AI. In other words, AI cannot replace a human being. That's my personal <laughs> opinion, okay. The third one is uh, AI with the human in the loop. That means AI is not just uh, helping us, but uh, human should be the decision-making uh, process in the loop. So. AI with the human in the loop. That means we are making decisions together with the AI, particularly in life critical situations, in time critical situations. In the time you needed to make a decision in the matter of uh, microseconds in the automatic driving car, for example, there is an accident right? The four passengers within the car, and there were different probability of a survival. And uh, you turn this way, turn that way, or straight away, there are different survival rate, and the four passengers have, would have a different survival opportunities. And that decision is a microseconds, and who would be survival take the best chance? Who make that decision, for example? So today, I'm going to show you a prototype system we developed uh, over a long time. We got a ARC discovery project with the Royal Brisbane Hospital ICU unit. And after that, we got a sponsored PhD 
postal, and also now we call the UQAI collaboratory, as you can see. That is a UQ-sponsored AI research center. This project is going to be a place we can think about how AI can help us. And I'm not with some mouse. <laughs> I'm not going to be replaced by AI once the life critical situation is coming. So that means we needed to make AI as a human ampl uh, intelligence amplifier. So let's just uh, run the system. Where is, uh, sorry. I needed to, where is the, uh, my link. <laughs> oh, where is a link? My try and help, but being a lens. Yeah, <laughs> well, there is a URL link on my slides. Uh, uh, yeah, here, here. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so this is a real-time system, but uh, today we just show the demo system. So if you get into the ICU, there is a timeline, and we use different colors to represent uh, whether it is normal or abnormal. And uh, let's say just a green color means okay, and the red color means something terrible. And then along the time, if you click on that, you can see the situations of a patient, and also you can get a, a real-time monitoring data about the bedside sensors. And also you can have a, a different situations. For example, let me just, let me make it smaller. For example, the number one most deadly disease is the sepsis. Patient didn't have a sepsis before they come to ICU. Sepsis is the disease they got within the ICU. And then we needed to monitor on that and predict on that and recommend the treatment for the patient. And before you recommend that, we get a, a chance to search for over 2 million patients recorded in last 20 years in Australia and New Zealand hospitals. Every ICU patient, every 24 hours, they upload the data into the database over so many years. And then we needed to make that past the case, a click away available for doctors to compare, contrast the situations of the patient and also the treatment uh, available for patient. And uh, that database is sitting behind within the HPC computer, a large high performance computer with a very powerful computing power. And also we needed to find a similar patient for a specific patient, same gender, same disease, or same treatment, or same symptoms. How do you define that similarity? And it could be definable by doctors or automatically recommended by AI systems to find out uh, most similar patient and then to compare contrast your timely treatment for the doctors. And also, There is a summary. If you ask doctors and the nurses within the hospital, what is the most of the time they are spending on? Writing notes, do the paperwork, record what has happened. And why not we using the AI to do that from time to time? But of course, we do the recommendation using ChatGPT to read your data. And then doctor read this, uh, no, 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 it doesn't make sense. And then they start uh, to modify it, to use keyboard to modify it. And if you modify it, you submit it. 
That's your responsibility. AI doesn't take any responsibility. You click submit. That is your uh, legal responsibility. Okay. And then I can see there is a big gap between our system and one day you will be actually seeing this in the ICU. I think it's 10 years away because after we finish everything, we still need to do the shadow testing. Shadow testing means we don't tell anyone. We just sign in the ethical approval and uh, sitting behind the screen. Doctor doesn't know, patient doesn't know. We don't connect online and everything is done. And then we try to evaluate whether this one would be better off. And after many years or many cases, and then we can show the public or show to the stakeholders, say, if this AI can really help. It's not a way, I know that. But it is my dream before I die, I can say that, oh, that's a thing about me. <laughs> anyway, okay. So how can AI help? There are so many things we can do. We can click on the systems make AI triggered to help us. But what we are really talking about today is we call the prompt engineering for high order reasoning. Prompt engineering means between the human user and the chat GPT, there is something we call the API. The API presented as a prompt. So prompt engineering means you organize the user's data and hand over that chunk of the data timely to ChatGPT and then let ChatGPT to give you some help. What kind of help? There are so many different help. You need to know what you are asking or you know nothing, then you just ask. What kind of question you can ask and what kind of help you are looking for? And there are different uh, prompt patterns. And the prompt patterns means there are so many categories of help you can get, but which one most timely or important you are looking for at this time moment. So we call the prompt engineering. Some of my PhD students, they are doing that at the moment and they try to automatically package the data hand over to the chat GPT and let them to do those four things. We call it high order reasoning because we know the low order reasoning that is where, how, when, what. So that's kind of question. We call the low order reasoning. That is a search based reasoning. You have a decision tree, you have a question and you have a decision rule and then you have a solutions for that. But high order reasoning means I know what you are doing, but I'm not convinced. I need to talk to you. First one called what if. What if means I know what you are doing, but I challenge your conditions. I challenge your motivations. I challenge you why you are doing this. You can have a, a, a we call the, a very good uh, pace. What if that temperature is wrong? What if that condition is not satisfied? Or what if in 10 minutes something happening? So I challenge your decision conditions, the assumptions. <clears throat> oh. So what is challenging your motivation? I know what you are doing, but uh, so what? You can have a very successful operation but a patient died. So what, right? So your motivation, the significance of what you are doing will be challenged by ChatGPT. This is a high order reasoning what we are doing. And also there is another one, why not? This kind of high order reasoning means I know what you are doing. However, there is another approach. ChatGPT believe this is a better one. Why not you do this such such things instead of your recommendation, your treatment? 
that is our assessment of uh, the chat GPT based on the large data or big data analysis over the behind the screen. How about it's the challenge on the applicability of your method. I know what you are doing, but how about we apply your method for something else? Your, your patient treatment is for HIV disease. How about I using that for COVID-19, for example? So all of those things would be supported by the chat GPT behind the screen. And uh, the chat GPT could be also proactive. Proactive means you are doing whatever you do, but the chat GPT say, watching you. Do you like to be watched over your job in your <laughs> position? I don't know. But we do this as a technical solution. If you like, you can enable it. If you don't like, just take it down. But chat GPT could be proactively talk to you and then ask you some questions in terms of a high order reasoning here. And then uh, there is a, a, a trouble of the script. I should uh, scale, up, scale it down. Yeah, make it smaller. And then you can answer chat GPT's question. And now uh, you can drag and drop pictures and to justify your decisions. And then chat GPT says, okay, follow your talk, uh, follow your conversation and make sure you are really doing the right thing for the, the right time. So if I summarize what we are doing here, is we provide us four levels of service. First level is a fact. We search the database behind the screen. There are large database. Secondly, we provide you the opinions. You say, okay, opinion, opinion is dangerous, right? You got uh, your different culture, different ethics, different social economical impl implications. Whenever you have an opinion, it's dangerous. It's a bias or something like that. But anyway, you can tune the chat GPT, have your personalized fine tuning model for you, specifically adapted to your background, your culture background or whatever background. And that is the second thing. Third thing is chat GPT would provide the service and the knowledge whatever knowledge, decision rules, no, uh, the database, uh, uh, the, the medical knowledge or whatever. This is the third one. The last one is decision support. To make decisions on your behalf in a very timely manner, because that is a time critical, life critical situation. You don't have time to make a decision within the microsecond, and then you need to do that. So that is uh, what we are doing. Okay. So previous page is about chat GPT. And we have a few PhD students catching up this and they are doing fantastic job and using medical data talk to the chat GPT we call the Prompt engineering. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Lee. Um, I think I can speak for everyone here um, and say that it's quite exciting, but also a little bit scary to see how technology will continue to evolve um, in the coming years. Now, I won't keep you for too long. Um, we do have Dr. Jess Court is just on her way. She's about five minutes out, but we will get the panel discussion started. Um, so let's dive in. Um, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator for tonight's panel discussion, Tim Anderson. Tim has a wealth of knowledge and experience in designing and delivering major transformational projects in tech, and I have no doubt he'll lead us in an engaging and thought-provoking uh, conversation about the opportunities and challenges of generative AI. Tim, the floor is yours. Fantastic. 
Sorry, that was really loud for a second. We will keep that mic over here. Yep. What we are going to do is we're going to do a test as well. For those of you watching at home, we're going to try to use the mics that are in the ceiling. But if it doesn't work, like yell and scream and wave your hands or put something in the chat and Nina will give us a signal and then we'll start throwing the mic around. Everyone in the room, can you hear me too? Yeah, if you can't, it's because I'm going to have an intimate conversation with people here. Um, if you can't, once again, wave, scream, go, hey, Tim, speak up. Cool. You know what you've got to do? Fantastic. Come on up. Claire, can everyone give a round of applause for Claire? I was going to say Dr. Claire. And Claire, come on back up as well. With another round of applause. Um, I'll grab this one to start with. But before we do get started, I'd like to answer your question, like, who is the boss? A lot of people think it's Angela and Tony. Um, I reckon it's Mona. Oh, that was really meta just then. You have to look that up. Okay, cool. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, who's, who's the boss? Community. Ah, oh, you got so much TV. I watch lots of TV. Very meta. Um, they'll look it up later. They'll laugh. People at home are probably doing that right now instead of listening to us. Claire, can you introduce yourself yeah, for us? Yeah, of course. Um, so I'm Claire Norton. I'm from CSIRO's Data 61, which is our data and digital technology arm of our national science agency. And so in Data 61, we do a lot of work with industry and government around AI and a heap of other different digital technologies. Um, we've used AI to help us predict the spread of bushfires, um, to help us identify when someone's about to have a seizure, um, even to help you get home quickly in traffic and use it to predict traffic flows so you can avoid the crashes and find the most efficient way home. And so in my line of work, we specifically look at the human aspects around AI digital technologies. We're really interested around how we can really maximise the opportunities that these technologies present, particularly by looking ahead, looking at where these emerging trends, where these emerging technology developments are starting to unfold, and looking at how they could impact different organisations, different industries, different policy domains, and working with organisations to help them make better decisions about those future, future trends. Before we started, we were geeking out, so we've already got a head start. You guys are behind on the conversation. I apologise. We'll try to rehash that as well. It was a really good question that I had for you. We just started. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> Wait, I know you sort of introduced yourself before. You want to give us another quick update? Yeah. Go for it. Come closer too. You can just sit and talk. I think they can hear us at home. Correct? Yes. Fantastic. Yeah. My bachelor's degree is on the database. So I call myself a data people. When I was a lecturer in QUT, I taught uh, export system. Uh, export system was, at that time, was a little bit uh, AI. But not, after that, we, we talk about cloud computing and the grid computing and everything, distributed computing and the data mining. And the machine learning, now everybody talking about the AI. And then my research will be evolving like that. Cool. First question I've got for probably both of you. One thing you were saying before, Shui, about the number of data points that are in what you're doing here is like 20 million, something like that. Um, and you're definitely going to be seeing it in what you're doing there as well is um, the tendency of survival bias particularly in the health industry. So you've got all of these data points. How do we ensure that from a survivability point of view, that when we're not using wrong data or not assessing all of the data? How do you put stuff in place to make sure that doesn't happen? I think it's a very important question. Uh, we human average by average have 80 billion neurons and the chat GPT-4 has one trillion. So, the parameters of artificial neural nets just by it, connect it under the big memory and then train the big machine. And that is getting bigger and bigger. So we talk about data points. It's a forever sparse data. Because if you have 100 parameters or variables, each variable has the two possible values. That is a two power to 100 converted to 10. The decimal number is uh, 10 plus 33 zeros. Mm. That uh, is a capacity of the database to take in potential data. But actually, whatever you collect the data is 
very, very fast. It's a 0.0001% of your total possible data space. Uh, so and it's like that. Claire, what are your thoughts? Well, I think particularly when talking about the, the data that AI systems are trained upon, like bias, it's, it's a common thing that we often talk about, particularly like in healthcare applications. If we're developing, say, an algorithm that's trained on a healthy neurotypical population that doesn't, you know, doesn't have the sort of natural cognitive, um, I guess, declines that we see with an aging population, and then we try and take that same system and use it to diagnose a disease or a condition in an older population, we're going to see not only sort of challenges with the accuracy of that prediction, but then also, yeah, there could be like implicit or unknown biases that can weigh into the decisions that we're making around that system. But having said all this, and this is kind of what we were talking about before, humans are really biased too in their decision making mm. too. We have a wealth of different shortcuts and mental heuristics that we use to make our decision making a lot more efficient. So um, it shouldn't be so hard on the AI, but it seems to be mindful of it, thinking about how we design and sort of build in ways to check for responsibility, to check for bias, check for, um, I guess, best decision making processes. So how do we build in those processes to ensure that we're checking our own biases and checking the the AI AI's biases and then whose bias is it and the person who's putting in the information in the beginning is that but so how how the heck do you do that yeah, so some potential approaches that have been taken is looking at developing a set of ethical principles for how we think about how we design, develop, and deploy AI systems. So the Australian government's developed a set of, I think there's seven, eight, I should know this. Seven or eight, yeah. Principles, which look at transparency, which look at accountability, which look at um, bias and these different ways in which, um, I guess, these different metrics or considerations that we should be taking into account when looking at and evaluating, essentially, what are the impacts of those systems? Are, are these conforming to these principles? It's essentially a, um, a framework that we can use to sense check some of those assumptions. You have just arrived at the perfect time, Jess. We were just talking about biases around the data that's in AI. I will give you the mic. Firstly, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, um, I'm Dr. Jessica Court. I do research into what I call human-centered AI, which is essentially trying to put people's needs first. And instead of going, hey, there's a data set, I wonder what we can do with it, actually engaging with people and communities to figure out what they want AI to do and ethically collecting the data that we need to do it in that order. Uh, I'm also very bad at navigating around Brisbane city streets, <laughs> which is why I'm a little bit late, so apologies. That's totally fine. So while you're still, still speaking, I know when we met uh, a couple of days ago, time blurs for me, um, we were talking about the inclusion, especially around hearing um, disabled people and how we would include people so that therefore biases weren't built in. What's your thoughts on biases that are within the potential biases that were in uh, AI and, and how we can stop that, build yeah. for it? So without having heard all of the previous answers, um, so apologies if I'm reiterating stuff, um, but one of the things that we know about existing data sets is they're often very biased. They tend to have the same biases that we see everywhere else. You're more likely to be represented if you're white, cisgendered, male, and American. <laughs> Which obviously does not represent the whole population of the world. We're also finding that people who are disabled, and or from linguistic minorities are missing out on the technologies that are becoming commercialized. The research that I'm actively doing at the moment is working with the Australian deaf community because, quick show of hands, how many of you have a voice activated personal assistant in your house? Yeah, that's a lot of people. If you're deaf and you don't speak and you can't hear, you cannot use a voice activated technology. So we're trying to make something that, you know, can understand sign language and be able to sign back in order to give that equity of access. Now, that's obviously one example of a situation where an AI has been created that doesn't serve everyone equally. There are other things to consider depending on, you know, 
who is in the room, who's getting to be represented. So the approach that I like to take is to work with a particular community, and then we can collect data that actually represents the community. Because obviously we're not going to get language data from every single deaf person in Australia, but we can reach out to a lot of them and go, you know, we have deaf people who are white, deaf people with Asian heritage, deaf people who have other disabilities, and we're able to get a more nuanced and textured data set. And I think that's something that has not been addressed by mm. commercial AI so far. Yeah. So commercializing AI, uh, AI um, we're, we're in businesses, businesses are making decisions of this, hospitals are making decisions of this. When it comes to a bad decision being made, someone's asked in here, what's the legalities around that? Who's liable? And I know, Joy, you said that, you know, the, the responsibility is on the doctor pushing the button, but <laughs> but what are your thoughts on all of that, especially when, you know, uh, companies who are developing these AIs have some sort of responsibility to ensure that it's, you know, up to date, unbiased, et cetera, et cetera. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think, uh, firstly, AI, if AI is interpretable, explainable, understandable. So after that, human should take a responsibility. Otherwise, you say, that is a deep model. I have no idea how it is pre-trained. I'm not sure responsible, but why you take a consequence? Mm. Why don't you ask the explanations from the deep learning model? Yeah. So ultimately, human yes. makes a responsibility. To add to that, Claire, from psychology background, mm -hmm. Knowing people. Yeah, I was going to say, I'd kind of go for a bit of a policy spin on that in terms of, I guess, from the regulation side of things, in yeah. a lot of technology domains, we are seeing, I guess, like this, this lag with how we think about, okay, well, how do we actually respond when these unintended or sort of malicious sort of uses of AI or um, other technologies come up? And it can be a challenging space. It can be challenging to kind of understand and predict what these potential consequences can look like, what the right policy settings, what's the right legal settings, what essentially we need to be preparing for so that we can sort of best manage, I guess, the outcomes that then might not be a favorable one. Um, and I think that's a challenge that a lot of different sort of legal and um, regulation domains are facing in terms of trying to kind of have the front foot against these uh, technology developments. Okay. Cool. We're going to have the mic for everyone so everyone oh, can hear. Okay. Is that okay? Yep. Cool. Yep. We were going off the mics before in the roof. You didn't know that, so that's not your fault. It's totally okay. Done. Um, Sorry, can I just add on to Yeah, yeah, part? go. Um, so one thing that has been interesting, and this is very new research. I saw it at a conference end of last year, um, but designers of AI can help people to engage with the answers AI is spitting out in a really positive way by letting them know how confident the AI is. Mm -hmm. Because there was an experiment done where if the AI said, you must do this, the person did it. If the AI said, I'm 70% confident that you should do this, the person would likely do it, but would put their own judgment. If the AI said, I'm 25% certain you should do this, the person usually did the opposite of what the AI was suggesting. So having that confidence level be visible makes a huge amount of difference to a person blindly going, well, I guess the computer told me what to do. And on that, someone's asked a question around how you build trust in AI, which is to what you're saying. Do you think that there's also an element, not just a percentage, but a, uh, an understanding that users might want about how that decision is made? Did they do anything on that part of the study? Uh, not in the particular research I was thinking of, um, but there's definitely folks working in explainable AI, which is making sure you can unpack and understand what are the factors that went into making a decision to understand it. So, Claire, oh, sorry, why? Yeah, yeah, maybe there are a few things also we can consider. One is the cost-based decision-making process. You consider consequence first. So if you made a mistake, what kind of cost you would be paid for? The secondly is, uh, is a track record. So over so many years of partnership, do I trust uh, this one? So you you establish that kind of mutual, like a uh, couple. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. 
So one more question. I want to go back to the legal side of things as well, Claire. So you were talking about policy a bit earlier. Obviously, everyone knows that technology increases at a rate regulation bureaucracy can't keep up with, and there seems to be an exponential nature with AI, as well as these uh, principles that they put in place. Is there anything else you think that we could be doing to in stem the damage, potential damage of the technology increasing at a rate we can't keep up with? That's an interesting question. Um, yeah. I guess like the, I guess one of the core foundational, um, I guess, skill sets we often talk about is just general digital literacy, just getting people across, you know, how these systems conceptually work. We don't need to all know how to program an AI system, but if we can kind of understand generally how it works, we can understand, you know, that ChatGPT is a predictive model. It's predicting generally how these words string together and it produces a paragraph that sounds all right. sounds like a human had written it because it's predicted it. And so if we have that sort of implicit or I guess base level knowledge, then we can kind of start to know how to use these systems more effectively. We can start to realize what sort of things could this tool be useful? What sort of tasks can I use with this tool? Maybe if I'm wanting to like process a massive amount of data really efficiently, yep, an, an AI system might be really good at doing that. But if I'm looking to diagnose a medical condition, maybe that's a space that, you know, the human judgment really comes into it and the experience comes into it. And so I think it's probably more around just, I guess, raising the bar into terms of that overall sort of digital and AI literacy. Um, and there's a lot of different initiatives that are happening both at, I guess, that local level, but then that national level to help that. Um, even like, you know, in schools, the fact that kids now code in, in primary school, I can't imagine like how much that's going to put them ahead when they're starting to, I guess, you know, move into these digital careers. And at least just like, even if they're not coding in their jobs, they at least have that understanding around, you know, how these logic systems typically work and how these, um, I guess, these tools might, um, you know, what, what's happening behind the scenes. Mm. Jay, do you have any thoughts? No? <laughs> well, I want to ask you from, a, a, I'm going to lean into the educational side of things because a lot of the questions here and ones I had was about what are the skills, tools, resources, education, things that we need to do moving forward to get the most out of AI, considering that everyone fears, as the stats just set up there before, that um, AI is going to take our jobs. Ask me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you think we need to remain relevant from a skills point of view into the I future? Think, yeah, I think this is uh, uh, shooting on the moving target things. And uh, there are so many jobs that will be replaced by AI. But uh, they are just uh, replacing clerical jobs, repetitive jobs. Uh, like a very tiring job or whatever, like your son doing the yeah. hairdresser. I, I don't think that can be done by AI to <laughs> cut your hair. A lot of things are like this. So we need to be prepared for adopting AI for doing something like uh, we got uh, a slave. Or I, I, I don't know whether I should say that <laughs> correct. Take it as a servant and then do things with the AI as long as we are think adopted within our cultural background, ethical uh, and legal and whatever background. Otherwise, the AI is going to be a monster to our society and uh, we cannot just uh, worship it. We cannot go to church to confess with the AI <laughs> priest or something like that, right? So we must think about there is a boundary <laughs> and <laughs> that's your territory. This is my territory, something like that. And uh, to use AI at uh, like uh, drinking a tea, when you feel you, you like drinking a tea, you drink a coffee, you like to drink a coffee instead of tea. Otherwise AI should be out in our society. Yeah. Can I just let the record show if our um, AI overlords are listening? <laughs> Joy called you a slave, wasn't me or him. Okay? <laughs> totally cool. Just what, what are your thoughts? Like what do we need to, we need things that we need to adopt to remain relevant as we move forward? Or I'm going to throw in another one. What do we need to stop doing that we're doing now <laughs> that won't serve us, us in the future? So my opinion on this is that AI, like any technology, is a tool. It can be used for good things. It can be used for bad things. And like many of the exciting technologies that have developed throughout history, it will change the world. 
and the way we engage with work tasks and leisure activities. And this has the potential to be a really good and positive thing. It also has the potential to be a really scary thing. And I fully understand why people are going, oh no, it's the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. It is possibly a change to the way we're thinking or engaging with the world. And as with any technology, we can be open-minded about this. We can engage in ways that help to uplift all of humanity. I do personally have concerns about certain large companies who are using AIs in ways that I don't think will uplift humanity because their goal is the profit bottom line rather than the good of all. So can but I the potential's in, there. Can we name names? What industries do you think? <laughs> what industries do you think we should ban AI in? That's someone here asking, not me. Uh, as someone who works in academia and often seeks funding from big companies, uh, I'm not going to be able to answer that question. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> Claire, would you like to risk your job and she's been employed? No, oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's an interesting question. Can I, can I add on one more thing? Yeah, go for it. I think a creative work, uh, uh, the artist work, uh, a lot of things can be done by AI for sure, but they don't have a soul. And uh, in my turn, I would say, AI doesn't know first principle. How do you teach the first principle to AI? Currently, we call the pre-trained GPT, that G is generative P is a pre-trained. Pre-trained of what? Of human experiences. Mm. They don't take a high school, PhD, bachelor degree or whatever, but they, they pass that examination, like a medical exam, a lot of exam, the chat GPT can pass it, but they just learned mimic human knowledge. It's not knowing the first principle like Elon Musk to create something no, never people thought about it. How can AI be taught with the first principle? and create something new. Firstly, are we allowing AI to do that? Secondly, how the AI can be rediscovered, the students uh, of three laws, the physical laws, chemical engineering, and also those kind of electrical engineering principles. Mm. AI doesn't know anything. So on that, being trained by all of this data that all of we have produced, potentially some of the good work that I've done, do I or am I or should I claim some sort of an ownership over that training? Mm -hmm. Like, should I get paid for it? What about all of the, uh, you know, artists out there who are having their paintings used to train it? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a big question. I saw the discussions online a lot mm -hmm. under co-authorship for this kind of thing with the AI. But currently, we would say, no, nothing. If it is AI performed, AI created, and uh, we pay the using of that situation, uh, that uh, GPT, what's called uh, the token, $1 for doing something, $2 for something, anything created out of that cannot be claimed. That's my understanding. But uh, legally, there will be a law, I think, uh, for this uh, IP issue regarding the AI. But my personal view is class claiming nothing. Claire, what are your thoughts? It's an interesting one because wasn't there, I'm probably going to get the artist wrong, but Macklemore and Drake, wasn't there like a collaboration? And so it's kind of like, well, there was creative input that went into that. Should they get royalties off mm. every time that's streamed? Uh, I don't know these questions. I'm just posing them. But it's more like it's an interesting thing because it's like, you know, it's dilemmas that we haven't encountered before. And ultimately, there'll come a point where we kind of just, we need to make a decision about it. We need to make a decision around, you know, is there a way to trace how different pieces of information are fed? through the model like there's probably going to be even practical limitations for how you can even sort of monetize or acknowledge or attribute um, I guess that creative input mm. um, pro probably from the other side of things in terms of yeah like um, as Professor Lee was alluding to like can chat GPT be acknowledged as as a creator themselves like should we if they write a book should we list them as the author or is that the person who submitted the query and then you know wrote those words and published it and the current position is no like they're they're not considered an mm. author and and frankly you know people shouldn't be claiming original work of something that chat GPT had, has produced but there are all these sort of 
unique dilemmas that this current environment's throwing at us. And I think there'll come a point where we eventually just there's decisions that are made around this. Um, and I guess different organizations, different industries kind of take a stance on, you know, what they're comfortable with. I'm going to jump back into the uh, banning AI. Let's soften the question. <laughs> How about if we were just to regulate? In what way do you think we should regulate to ensure or safeguard people, especially displaced people? Uh, or underrepresented. Why did you hand me the microphone for the big question? Because <laughs> they just went, oh, I'm not going to talk about this. I want a job. <laughs> um, so I definitely think there's places where we should, for now, be either legislating or regulating or controlling in some way the ways AI gets used. There are certain things that I don't want AI to be doing. I don't want... AI to be making a decision about whether or not a person should go to jail after they've been accused of something. We have seen uh, folks in the US, not so much does someone go to jail or not, but is this person a risk and should they be given bail? And what it turned out was if you were black, you don't get bail because that was the pattern of the data it had been trained on because, of course, it's horrendously biased. Um, until we're able to solve some of those problems with the caveat that we might not ever be able to solve these problems without surveillance states that track all the data from every single person so that it's truly representative, which introduces different problems. Uh, that may not be something that we want to see AI doing. Uh, right. Yeah, similar thing when I talk about ICU using AI, if a patient die, who is responsible? Yeah, that kind of uh, government must uh, step into this legal field, uh, otherwise it's too late. And AI is uh, in, in what's called, uh, is in the chips. Now it's called AI chips everywhere. Mm. Everywhere we are using AI already now. But uh, who are responsible still, I strongly believe this is... Uh, human whoever purchased that device who make that device working by connecting electricity and then this device is working that person should be responsible mm. you should know the consequence yeah you cannot say oh the ai did that yeah okay yeah. you don't have anything no. further around cool <laughs> so while you've got it as well um Going back to the should I have a stake in all of these GPTs because I've, you know, put so much out there. But yeah, privacy and data ownership, it, does that rate a question at all? How, how would that, should that be handled? I guess privacy of the information that someone's inputting into these systems, if we use chat GPT as just the example, like there's considerations that the user needs to take into account in terms of, you know, you don't want to be putting anything sensitive or confidential in there because essentially it's it's out in the system. It's in it, it's fed into that model and used to train and potentially will be spat out in a future query that you know you have no control over in terms of how that information is then used. And so, I think from a personal sort of user privacy and sort of cybersecurity perspective, there's a responsibility on the user in terms of um, you know their responsibility around the information that they put in and and how they sort of you know manage their sensitive and, and confidential information. Um, I guess from a you know privacy perspective then with like say open AI and I guess these companies that manage and, and develop these tools, there's huge privacy requirements for them. We've seen, you know, instances pop up with ChatGPT where, you know, some users' information has been temporarily leaked. And I guess there's um, you know, there's a lot of eyes on these companies. There's a lot of responsibility that they're holding in terms of these massive data sets. And um, you know, yeah, there's, I guess, you know, there's reputational risk for them in terms of if they don't manage the information well, if they don't have the right sort of protections around how the information's used and, and how that information is protected, then, um, yeah, it can diminish the trust in the system. Mm. It can diminish the extent to which people actually want to continue to engage with their tools. From the, the medical example you had before, Shui, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I also I have some government employee working with the, as a PhD student with me for using ChatGPT using the government data. Mm. And that kind of uh, sensitivity of the data is very huge. And like a Samsung employee uploading the 
private company data to the chat GPT and uh, get help from chat GPT and the, that information leaked to other users. So we are doing this research currently uh, because we can have three, basically three solutions. One is on the server side. Mm. So I use your server, you make sure my privacy is protected. I pay you by having a contract like a defense department, they can use ChatGPT as well, but they have a special kind of fine tuning model, mm -hmm. uploading their sensitive data and get a trained model and using that exclusively, but you have to pay for that. Mm -hmm. The second solution is on the client side. I do the privacy preservation, I encrypted everything, and I make sure my data will not compromise the, like uh, a general privacy preservation algorithms before I upload my data to the chat GPT. That is the second solution. The third one is you find a third party responsible for that, then you sign the contract, you get insurance and whatever, then it's up to your financial budget hmm. and then you get uh, your guaranteed because in chat gpt or ai models they allow you to they that p is for pre-training model but that is a general knowledge hmm. if you want to get a specific uh, your domain knowledge trained on that uh, like you said uh, in my medical icu field when we train that we needed to pay for that training, what we call the fine tuning model. Mm -hmm. And that is very expensive actually. After the training, we own that model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a privacy. Would you like to add? Yeah. Yes, Jess? So I'll try to be quick because I can see you've got another question. Oh, the up. next question's for you anyway, so you oh, just keep talking. Um, so I do think one of the things of thinking about, you know, how does AI intersect with privacy? This isn't a new question. This is in some ways the natural extension of the way we've been moving because in the modern world, every time you use a service or sign up for something, you are handing over a certain amount of your data. And every single one of us is making a decision every single day. Do you have our store's loyalty card? Would you like to sign up? We need your name, your phone number, your email address, and we'll from now on be tracking every single thing that you buy from our store so that we can determine whether or not to raise prices and when to put on sales to draw you back in. That's all moving in the direction of AI. It's still the same kind of decision making, but we don't think about it in the moment. It's only when we take that step back and go, oh, actually big picture, who's got my data? How are they using it? And should I be worried? And I think this ties into the comments earlier around we need more literacy around what is technology and also what is happening with our data and these interactions. And it's essentially a trade-off between convenience and possibly some kind of advantage and locking down your data. So for those people who might not be tech savvy, not me, I'm not a day over 27, <laughs> um, but in the older generation, how do we ensure that uh, they aren't left out of the loop as well moving forward? Because a lot of those people might not be on or might not be sharing the data in a digital way. And then for the future, how does that impact on generative AI making assumptions of what an older generation expects or does or whatnot? So that's also a hard one. I do think this is something where we're going to need to change the way society talks about and thinks about technologies. And that means that we're probably going to have to go back to things like TV. Do we have regular documentaries explaining how the newest and shiniest AI actually works that people can opt into? Well, that's still going to be opt in. There will be some people who don't engage with it. Um, I do think we've got the advantage of as we're getting more technology literacy into classrooms, we're able to make sure that people are growing up with this knowledge as background radiation. I'm not sure how we sort of do a top down, ensure everyone has the same background knowledge. Anything? Yeah. 
I was going to, I guess, highlight um, an interesting thing that we noticed um, when we're looking at, particularly over the pandemic, like a whole range of different digital trends and looking at different age groups in terms of um, the extent to which they engage with the whole range of different products and services we were presented with. And in areas like telehealth, like Older adults, particularly in Australia, are amongst the highest users of telehealth. So it's not as if there's not a capacity to engage with new technologies. I guess it's all about making it relevant. Like if this is a more convenient way for me to have my regular sort of check-in with my doctor, you know, get my prescriptions, then I'm going to use it. And I guess it's about, you know, looking at, okay, well, how was telehealth accessible? Like, was it via phone? Was it like, was was making it sort of an easy web interface? Did that make it more engaging and more accessible for the older demographic? So I think it's about, it's about highlighting that it's not just a, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks sort of mentality, but, you know, make it relevant. And I guess presenting it in ways that's actually going to, you know, they can see the value that it's going to add to their life. Oh. Lastly, if I was to leave you with 20 seconds to leave the audience both here and at home to get their juices flowing and thinking about how they should be interacting with AI or what you'd like them to leave with, what would that be? I hate being the first one off the you brain. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I guess the, the big thing for me is, I guess, having a curious mind around AI and I guess um, from you know, from a sort of perspective, particularly about your work, about your current job and how AI could maybe be impacting the way you do your job. Thinking about the ways in which you could potentially, you know, explore ways to maximise the opportunities it presents, looking at ways in which you can kind of have a curious mind around, well, what new skills could I potentially pick up if I didn't have to do that aspect of my work anymore, if I could look at ways in which I could sort of use these technologies to make this this dull, this boring, this monotonous part of my work um, more efficient. Um, and I guess looking at it more from that opportunity lens, as well as still having that sort of, you know, mindset around, okay, well, where could there be potential risks? Where do I need to be, um, I guess, mindful around my privacy and things like that? Joy, what do you want people to leave with today? tonight? Uh, to be optimistic to AI. Yeah. There is a big opportunity for every one of us, mm -hmm. especially for Brisbane, because uh, we are facing Olympic coming to uh, this city. Mm -hmm. And uh, personally, I got a lot of uh, new opportunities to do a project. We are doing the mega event uh, project and uh, we are remaking the whole Olympic uh, virtual world in, within the using metaverse and the uh, chat GPT, everything will come. The whole world will see the Brisbane <laughs> in a lifetime. So I, I'm excited to do things uh, with AI. Fantastic. Yes. So my opinion is that as with anything to improve AI, we need to diversify it. We need to diversify the data sets it's being trained on. We need to diversify who is contributing to AI and who is controlling AI. Because in the end, it's just a tool and how we use it will make the difference for the future. Cool. Now, there was one more question on here I'm going to answer because I haven't had a chance to answer yet. And it was around about how people could get involved with research. I'm going to make an assumption that if people wanted to learn more about how they can get involved in researching AI, they can first start by looking up on LinkedIn and reaching out. Yep, cool. Done. I answered a question. I feel special. Excellent. Um, thank you, everyone, for your questions. If you didn't get to ask one on the poll here, we're probably going to be hanging out, having a couple of beverages. Thank you to everyone at home. Sorry about the sound earlier on. Uh, at least you could hear me. And did anyone look up Mona is the boss yet? No? Cool. Do it. It's really good. Excellent episode of Community. Janita, I'll pass over to you. Wonderful. Well, mainly just a big thank you to to all of you and what, what a discussion that was. And I was looking at the questions coming through. You couldn't even see all the questions on the screen. There were so many questions. Made it hard and for me. my gosh, we could have gone on for forever. Yeah. Um, and and I think this conversation will be going on for, for quite some time over the coming years and and especially now, even at home and at work at in government and, and everything like that, and in research, especially in academia. Um, so no, what, what a great discussion. Uh, thank you so much for being here tonight. Yeah.
Now, just a really big thank you as well um, to the UQ venue staff and the Young Alumni Advisory Board members who are here tonight for making this event possible. Um, and a special shout out to Nina and, and her team who does the heavy lifting for these events. Um, that's, <laughs> yes, <you're laughs> <Nina. laughs> Now that does bring us to an end to the formalities of the event and, and definitely start, you know, are you optimistic? Please do um, start uh, uh, engaging in this live poll as well, but don't leave just yet. We will be um, re resuming the food and drinks as well. So please stay and chat and keep conversing and network uh, and uh, would love to see you at our next event as well. Um, but looking forward to having a chat with you afterwards. Thank you for coming.